So first, I thank again for the invitation and for this very great uh, workshop. And um, I will talk about uh, this tensile natural state methods. And then I chose this uh, topic as material science, ab initio quantum chemistry, but basically it's more like long range uh, interactions. And I put a lot of emphasis on the applications, but we received the mail uh, this week that uh, there should be a longer introductions or introducing some concepts because not everyone is aware of these different tools which uh, we are using. So I uh, just a little bit reorganized the talk and then I put the longer introductions and uh, I hope I could find a good balance between presenting materials and then the, the methods and, and the introduction. So just briefly that uh, uh, what I will focus on with the general form of the Hamiltonian, which includes uh, this one particle interactions and then the two particle scatterings. And the first part that we call is this kinetic term, which is just, let's say, hopping of electrons from one side to another one. We talk about lattice models. And then the second part, of course, uh, can be again in real space, again, some density density uh, correlations expressed in creation and relation operators, but uh, that can be, of course, completely general. So uh, I also have these indices alpha, beta to spin, uh, to denote like color indexes, which are just spins, like spin one half uh, uh, up and down fermions, but this can be more generalized so that we can also do SU3, SU4 systems and so on. And of course, the interactions can be also spin dependent. So this form, uh, we can use it in, in lattice models to study uh, problems in condensed matter physics, or we can also do, so this is just like a real space model, we can also consider these as molecular orbitals. Then we have the quantum chemistry version. Of course, this can be again spin dependent. That's what called unrestricted Hartree-Fock in quantum chemistry. We can also have these as spin or orbitals so that we can also use the tensor network state algorithms to uh, target the Dirac equations and then work everything in the relativistic frameworks. Or we can have proton neutron orbitals, then we end up with the nuclear shell DMRG or nuclear shell tensor network state algorithm. Of course, we can go to other representations like in momentum space, or we can have Hermite polynomials for particles in confined potentials. And of course, uh, the freedom is very broad, and, and uh, there are a lot of uh, problems that can be considered and encoded in this form of the Hamiltonian. And usually these are the things which I just listed, which uh, our codes are capable to treat, or there are just uh, of, uh, some other extensions. But uh, the main idea is that uh, this should be basis independent. So the major aim is to get some kind of uh, uh, eigenstates of a Hamiltonian. We can also include abelian, non-abelian quantum numbers, and so on. And nowadays, uh, in uh, this uh, ab initio version, we can go up to correlate some AD electrons on AD orbitals. And of, we have also access to the one and two body reduced density matrices, which are important concepts to get uh, information about correlations. So just briefly, that we all know that if you have a discrete tensor product space, that made up from component tensors, then from these local tensor spaces, which has some finite dimension, and the states are labeled by alpha to alpha i, then uh, this tensor that has, let's say, d legs, of course, the dimension blows up exponentially. This is the so-called course of dimensionality. And uh, we just want to get some kind of uh, an, uh, efficient data sparse representation of the wave function. And uh, any tensor, uh, the order tensor can be factorized as a product of lower order tensors. So here it's just this cartoon. There are some, some uh, uh, tensors which has a five physical legs labeled from one, alpha one to alpha six. And there are tensors which are assigned and connected to these, weird, uh, to these uh, physical ones. And there are also tensors which has only virtual legs. So, but basically this five order tensor can be factorized as a product of these lower order tensors. And this is a loop and below there is one which is without loop. And of course we know that the simplest one is this tensor trait or MPS or DMRG, and the representation is not unique. We just have simply the, the product of matrices, but we can always introduce the matrix and its inverse, and that uh, gives us some gauge freedom. And this is well known uh, fact for all of us. That's from, from uh, in DMRG community introduced by Steve Wine before there were uh, the AKRT model, and also later on, Vidar and work of Estrata and also in the mathematics community like Osradets and colleagues have introduced these methods as well. Now, all, uh, already in the early attempts in 96, there were attempts to make this uh, 
answers to more general for 2D, and this is the snake-like version from, the, from Steve White and uh, Rainer Noah to apply to 2D systems. While a natural way to extend it is this, the, to the PEPs, and that's of course uh, encores this correlation and entanglement structure in a much better way for a 2D lattice. Okay, now also other attempts, as we have heard many talks during this week for higher uh, dimensional networks. And for example, I just want to mention there is this three tensor network states, which might be also very useful to treat uh, long range interactions in general. And the advantage of this is that the maximum distance between two sites that scales logarithmically uh, with the distance whenever the coordination number is larger than two. So that this MPS or tensor train, in this case, the coordination number is two. While here in this graph, I, there are some tensors which have uh, three legs or four legs on the plane. And in this case, uh, the, they all have a physical leg, but this is not a requirement. But uh, the optimization of the networks cases D to the Z plus one. Uh, so there's an extra cost whenever we do these local updates and optimizations in the DMRG or tensor network states methods, but the sites in the boundaries, of course, uh, scales exponentially for, for a tree, so there's an advantage of this as well. And there are some recent modifications uh, together with a group of Frank Verstraten and Dimitri Fanek that Klaus Gunst uh, made modifications of, of this tree that he also included these virtual tensors, as I mentioned, that it's also possible. So it's a kind of a compromise between DMRG or MPS and tree. And there are some benchmark calculations on some, some molecules, but we could do, do this for any other systems that usually if the bond dimension is kept fixed, then uh, one or two orders of magnitude improvements can be achieved for the same bond dimension if we just change the tensor topology. So this is very promising, and it looks like that this is what we should do. But we have to also keep it in mind that uh, there is the extra cost for optimization steps, so that if we then take the overall cost and then we just measure the CPU times also together all the efforts to solve the problem, then so far we are uh, with the trees uh, almost at the same stage as, as with MPS or DMRG. So there is a need for larger systems or also there is a need to further optimizations. And this is something that I'd like to talk about today. So there is one way to make more general tensor networks. The other way is to make uh, some uh, other optimization steps. And just before that, just to refresh that uh, if we just cont uh, <clears throat> con contract these networks, that would be simply connecting uh, the Bryant cat components of the MPS. That would be simply the norm, but we can always leave out one, two, or three, or as many indices as we want. And that would just give us the one, two, or three uh, reduced orbital density matrix. And from these, uh, we can also calculate later on the entropies. And uh, again, just uh, briefly, the, the concepts that will be used uh, later during the talk is that if you have two, uh, operators A1, A2, then we can just define the covariance, which is just the taking the product of the operators and take the expectation value subtracted with the so-called connected part. So this is what we call the unconnected correlation function. And this can be uh, equally expressed in terms of the states so that uh, if we have the density matrix for component one and two or the combined system, again, we can calculate the reduced density matrices just uh, using the previously mentioned technique. And then we can express the correlations also in terms of the density matrices. And of course, uh, the state is uh, not correlated if for all operators, this covariance is uh, zero. And this can happen only if uh, the reduced density matrix is a product of the two reduced density matrices. Now for a pure state, it is a special case. We have also the Schmidt decomposition. And then the number of the, the Schmidt values, if it's just one, then it's just a product state. If you have more than one numbers, then we get the so-called entangled state, so it's no longer separable. And this can be also expressed in terms of entropies, and this, this D is what is so-called the relative, range, uh, relative entropy. And this is just a kind of distance that measured from the product states. And the mutual information, this I, is the one which can be expressed in terms of the entropies that are calculated from the reduced density matrices. And uh, this is nothing else, but S of rho is nothing else in terms of the von Neumann entropy that minus trace rho log rho. 
So the idea is that uh, we have access to subsystem uh, reduced density matrices from which we can calculate entropy quantities. And from these, we can also measure correlations and interactions that are important tools for optimizing tensor network state methods. And one possibility is that we already had a talk uh, on Monday from Mission Dupuy that uh, this ordering problem that whenever we have a, a more general network where the components are not the same so that the modes are different, then it makes a big difference that how a network is uh, optimized or how it's formed from, from these modes, that's how we arrange these modes. And for example, just as a cartoon, here I put uh, the lithium fluoride molecule as an easy example. And what is shown is this mutual information for an ordering where the, uh, where the one dimensional chain is just ordered from one to N. So it's from one to 25. We can see the, the strength of this mutual information with different colors. So that the red one is in the range of 10 to the minus two, the green is in 10 to the minus three and so on. And then if you repair new the orbitals, then we can localize these interactions, these correlations. And uh, this has a big tremendous impact on the performance and on the number of, uh, and on the structure of the Schmidt spectrum. And uh, we already had a, a talk on that on Monday. Um, a, a, a version that we used to do is that from this uh, quantity, we define the graph Laplacian. And the second eigenvalue of this is what is so-called the Fiedler vector. And this gives us a quasi-optimal ordering, which minimizes the graph envelope. And uh, this recent work from, from Mishong uh, goes on and then even uh, tries to analyze in more detail the Schmidt spectrum. And this is a, a problem which is still not solved and uh, requires, of course, a lot of work in the future as well. But uh, we are not only optimizing the, the networks and then the topologies, uh, but also we can also make change of basis. And that's very important that the two things should be done in hand by hand. So just uh, there were already early attempts uh, in the early 2000s to go from real space representations to momentum space representation, which for case of the Hubbard model is nothing else, but we just simply take the Fourier transform and then we end up with this momentum space representation. And the idea is that if we measure this one site uh, entropy, then if we have a real space representation and the interaction U is zero, then uh, we have a very hard problem because then we have a, uh, the entropy is nothing else but n times log four, where n is the number of the components that would be the sum of the total entropies. While if we go to the large U limit in the half field case, then the zero and double occupied uh, states are nothing uh, are excluded. So then it goes to log two. While the opposite case happens in case of momentum space representation that for U equals zero, we just have a product state. So the idea would be to find a basis uh, which is optimal as a function of interactions and of course for the given system that we study. And before that, the mode picture is also very useful that uh, to get also some physical information. And that's also something which uh, uh, there's a long history to study, for example, the, the systems in momentum space in terms of so-called geology, where the different scatterings between the plus and minus Fermi surfaces are characterized according to this forward, backward scattering, and so on. And the G3 is the one where we have a change in the wave factor, which is two times the, the Fermi vectors. This is what is so-called UNCLA. And even just studying these, these entropy quantities and correlation functions, it is easy to show that uh, in the case of half field case, the correlations are, and this, this much information gets large value because of the UNCLA, while for uh, adopt case, uh, this is not the case. So even physics, we can get out of these things. So let's see then, then what we can do on the fly if we want to do the mode optimizations. Is that, for example, we can have, uh, make a change on the Hamiltonian. And so that if you have some unitary operator and we could apply this and then somehow get a function that we could uh, minimize. And then uh, that's something that, for example, taking the energy. And if we can calculate the expectation value of the operators, then we can also make a kind of gradient search. But this uh, has been, uh, we have tried this a very long ago with Valentin Mou, Frankfurt Strat, and Rainer Noack, but we found that sometimes it was uh, not so stable numerically. And another approach was by the work from Riesler, Noack, and White when they tried to use the one particle reduced density matrix, which leads to the natural orbital basis, but this also uh, didn't work out well in general on the optimization way. 
So the other idea is that this, this global unitary, we can make up from a uh, component wise so that we can make, apply uh, local unitaries on the MPS matrices and uh, sweep back and forth in the network, like as we do in this usual tensor network state methods. And uh, for each uh, local in, uh, iteration steps, we collect components of this global unitary and uh, we construct it from, from after a full sweep or full update. So basically this is just a minimization uh, optimization problem on a given fixed rank manifold. And to find uh, this U opt local, which means that we have some function that we have to minimize. And let me say that what is this cost function and how it is done, at least um, in our case that when we have this joint operator just putting together two MPS matrices, then in the usual SVD, we just split up into two components. That's this usually MPS or DMRG technique. While now we can also apply a unitary and orbital rotations on the, on the two, on this component tensor and do the SVD after that. And uh, we can then calculate again the Schmidt spectrum before and after uh, the before the rotation. And the idea would be that uh, we use a cost function, which is the half Rainy entropy, because uh, as it is known, this is a, a, a very good quantity that the predefined accuracy uh, can be upper bounded by the Rainy entropy if alpha is smaller than one. So that uh, the idea is that we would like to do uh, uh, find a rotation with some angle and to find this optimal angle, we just do SVD uh, sequentially uh, with some minimization method. And for this, for example, the needler mid method can be used or, of, or some other gradient search as well. So we try to find in a given iteration step some kind of uh, local unitary that reduces the, the Schmidt rank and the Rainy entropy. And if we do this for a full sweep going back and forth several times, then uh, we can uh, update the global unitary. And this is what we do with fixed bond dimension. And after some, some sweeps, we stop and then we do this global reordering. So it is still very important to do this global reordering and, and uh, work on these techniques as there were some questions on Monday that whether the, the work of, of Mishang uh, how it's connected, and then I, I, and he was very right when he said that for a given basis, what they did was extremely useful because we will always end up with a basis, and in that basis, we always need a global uh, uh, reordering techniques as well, so that the combination of the two is something that uh, should be done in the future. Of course, it is possible to extend it to more sites than two, and this is also connected to the talk of Glenn Evan Lilly yesterday that when he talked about the wavelets, and then he also had some extensions for, for more general rotations. Okay, so some, some example from the numerics is that uh, this is just a beryllium ring where we took an initial calculation, so six beryllium atoms. And uh, what is shown is the bond dimension as a function of the DMRG steps. So if we fix the truncation error, so that the, some, some error criteria, and then we allow the bond dimension to change dynamically, then we can monitor that what is the computational resource that is needed to reach the exact solution. And in the original basis, which was some hard focal orbitals, the bond dimension went up to 8,000. So it was a very expensive calculations to get the full share exact solution. While if you do the mode optimizations, even after the first iteration step, it dropped down the maximum to 600. And after the 10th iteration, it was 300. So it makes a big difference that we can run a calculations in an optimal basis with a fraction of the bond dimension. And on the left panel, on the right panel, we can see that starting from the hartley fock orbital, then we do the optimization, the usual tensor network states without basis optimization, this would be the dashed blue line. Or if we turn on the mode optimizations, we get the blue light line. And if we start from another or basis, for example, in quantum chemistry, we can use this uh, split valence localized orbitals or foster boys localized orbitals. It has a big history of uh, finally optimizing basis. We still uh, sometimes get an improvement uh, compared to that. Okay, so the idea is that originally this, this mutual information, the one that measures the correlations, the, is pretty much uh, not so much a, a diagonal dominant, 
And then if we do the mode optimizations, uh, we end up something that is shown in the right panel where we can see this correlation matrix becomes pretty much uh, diagonally dominant in this basis. And then of course, uh, if we measure the, this cost function, which is nothing else but the mutual information weighted again with some distance function, then the big reduction can be also monitored. Okay, now this is nice, but this can be also done not just in quantum chemistry or in these frameworks, but already in, in, in condensed matter physics applications. And this brings closer uh, a bit this uh, the two community that if we have the, the two dimensional lattice and let's say this spin less fermions where have, we have the hopping and the Coulomb interactions, and then we put uh, periodic boundary conditions in both directions so that we end up with a cylinder uh, with a torus then this is a nightmare for MPS because of the, of the very high level of entanglement in the system. And uh, this snake-like procedure, of course, also doesn't work. But if we do the optimizations now on the MPS manifold and on the Grassmann manifold, and then we end up with this general form of the Hamiltonian, and then just as an example, on the left panel, we can see for some six by six lattice that if we run the calculations with different bond dimensions shown by different dashed lines, uh, in the real space basis, this is the ground state energy. And then if we do the same thing with, with this uh, mode optimizations, we almost get the same energy with 64, uh, with the bond state, with the bond uh, order 64, just as what would one get with almost 1000. And the same is for 256. In the inset, we show the final size scaling and it is clear that uh, with the optimized modes, we get a much faster and more robust final size scaling to the uh, exact solution. It is also possible to get the one and two particle reduced density matrices in the rotated basis. And this we can back rotate to the original basis and therefore we can also extract the, the different um, correlation functions and uh, order parameters. And on the right panel, we just show the charge density wave order parameter it's a function of the interaction. And this was basically impossible to get it uh, accurately in the real space basis. But if we do this mode optimizations and then make the very accurate calculations and then back rotate the quantities to the original basis, we get this uh, <clears throat> uh, bold phase black curve, which shows that how the order parameter uh, opens up as we go to the charge uh, density wave phase. So entropy-wise, what happens is on the left panel, we can see the so-called block entropy, which is just the bad entropy uh, as it is uh, collected as we see back and forth the system. And then the dark blue is the one which is the original basis. And then after the first iteration mode optimizations, we get the red one and then the green one and so on. And then we end up with a very nice symmetric profile at the very end, which already gave us a, a factor of 10 reduction in the block entropy and keep it in mind that this is a logarithmic function. And this is why we can get the same results with a couple of hundreds of, of states in the optimized modes than was uh, possible only with a couple of thousands of states in the original basis. Now, this is nice. And of course, we would like to know more about the, the scaling and area law, and there are many questions. But uh, before that, I would like to say that if we collect the maxima of this block entropy and then plot it as a function of the interaction, which you can see on the right panel, then in the, in the original basis, uh, uh, the real space basis, these curves diverges as uh, V gets zero. While on the other case, uh, in the optimized mode picture, there is just a little bump, but otherwise it's always almost zero. So for V equals zero, the mode optimization automatically finds the Fourier representation and then the momentum space solution. And then for large V, it also finds the solution because uh, it's the entropy is zero because the final configuration <clears throat> is just one determinant corresponding to the checkerboard uh, structure of the charge and the wave. So in between, <clears throat> there is some, the, the quasi particle starts to interact. So there is some kind of a, uh, entanglement and correlation that is uh, uh, generated. But if we just plot it uh, for different system sizes, then we can also see that uh, how they scale. And it is important to say that we get a big reduction in the bond dimension, but we have to say in, in a fair picture that the MPO bond dimension on the other hand increases, but these terms are can be applied independently during the course of the iterations and then the course of calculations. So using massive parallelizations, this can be reduced and then the reduction that we gain with the entropy is far much more than the increase in the bond dimension in terms of CPU time cost. Just a five minute warning. Yes. 
So uh, as a function of, uh, of the inverse of the bond dimension, we can also monitor that what happens with the entropy functions. And then we can see that uh, increasing the, the, the bond dimension, they saturate. So this is a nice feature. And of course, to get a finite system size uh, uh, analysis of the, of the block entropy in the optimized modes and things like that, we need uh, further work for, for even more accurate data sets. Also, there has been already work for applying to this higher dimension efforts so that the tree, so that something like that is to make some statements about DMR, G3, and other networks, I think we must do all these mode optimizations all together with, with the network optimizations to, to make some comments later on or rigid statements. And just as I said that we could also do something in two dimensional systems now, and there is some example on this graphene nanoribbon, which we all know that uh, if uh, some flat bands, but if we switch on the interactions, the Coulomb interactions, then correlation starts to develop along those edges. So these edge states, which are uh, topologically protected, there is uh, some, some ferromagnetic uh, uh, correlations that along the edges and anti-ferromagnetic correlations among the edges. And before we did some DMRG simulations on this with the with, uh, real space basis going up to a bond dimension of, of 20,000. And now after doing these, these mode optimizations, uh, we can do this with much, again, with much bond dimension so that now we are also studying that the, what is into emerging modes that how they reflect these different topologies like the zigzag or armchair and so on so this mode picture is very useful also to study the the physical quantities and of course like magnetizations and other things can be also studied more effectively because in the optimized modes uh, we can do very accurate calculations this can be also connected to, to even more the more complicated systems. So we can fold these graphene sheets to form nano, nanotubes. And then in nanotubes, we have again topologically protected edge states. And in this uh, work, uh, together with a group of, of professors around, we did something that uh, these in gap states which we have this protected uh, topologically protected in that states. Uh, if we switch on the interactions, uh, there are some giant end spins which uh, develop on the two edges of the of this nanotube, and then the ground state becomes a state with a total spin equal to the number of these edge states. And what is important that uh, by tuning the interaction and then the the dielectric fields, uh, we can basically also adjust the interactions between the edge states, between the end spins. And again, to do this in real space representation would be very difficult, but we go to another basis. So for example, we express the the one uh, the kinetic operator and then we just uh, diagonalize and go to the eigen basis of the one particle uh, Hamiltonian and then express, let's say, a long range Coulomb interaction in this way. And then we form again this general form of the Hamiltonian. Then we have access to three really large problems and we can also get all these different uh, physical quantities, which would be uh, very difficult or almost impossible to do it in the original basis. Plus we can also further optimize it with these mode optimizations. Now we can do also the mode optimizations in time evolution. So just briefly that if you make a quench, then we generate some quasi particles which interact with each other and they generate entanglement. And then if you combine this again with mode optimizations, and here is an example for a spinless uh, problem, again, starting from some from, from, um, charge order uh, configuration, and we measure the imbalance between the even and odd sides with the dark blue, we can see that how this imbalance is, uh, evolves in time. And then if we do with different lower bond dimensions, then we see the deviation for R equal eight, which is the bond dimension eight is already at 0 0.7. But if you combine this together with mode optimizations, then we end up with this orange curve and the orange curve starts to deviate from the exact only at time step 2.5. So this would be something to extend the time evolution for much longer time and get uh, rid of this so-called entanglement barrier between the initial and final states. Okay, so the last uh, thing just to mention that uh, we the, these tensor network states can be of course combined with uh, other conventional methods like couple cluster and Simon Kual had a talk on that also on, on Monday and something that this is very uh, advantageous that we combine these tensor network state together that we do DMRG and we put couple cluster on the top of it. And there is some work also with the mathematician colleagues that uh, the, this DMRG TCC has a quadratic error bonds and there are many new results and uh, there are very intense work on this to combine mode optimizations together with, with this uh, CC and, and other methods. 
And here I just like to say that uh, these last things, as I already mentioned, that uh, all these things can be massively paralyzed on, uh, on the present day con uh, computer technology, either on GPU cards, or there are some recent works where uh, going using this uh, DMRG for quantum chemical systems, there's a paralyzation by Irka Brabets and, and Libor Weiss uh, uh, and Ian Brandes that we uh, managed to go up some almost a linear scaling in computational time uh, up to 2000 cores. So even if we lose this, this local picture uh, in lattice models, we end up with this so more general quantum chemistry like or this general Hamiltonian. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very useful thing because with polarizations together with the big reductions in the entropies, we really can target very large problems and and history, but there are very interesting questions, but it also has a, a very important practical aspects as well. So just as a summary, um, together with uh, different tensor topologies, together with basis optimizations, uh, we can boost the performance of, of, of uh, tensor network state methods. Uh, this uh, local mode optimization uh, works as a black box tool. We can also apply it in long time evolution and combination of TNS with other conventional methods can exploit the benefits of all the methods. And together with massive parallelization simulation of realistic materials is getting uh, closer and closer for us. And I thank you very much for your attention.